What's up guys? I'm Ryan the Cyber Hobbit, and I made this remote controlled 3D printed motorized Iron Man helmet. And in this video, I'm going to show you how. Let's go. Okay, so to start off, I'm going to do a quick demo and show you guys all the features of the helmet. That way you can know what I'm progressing to throughout the video. So I have three ways to actually control this helmet. I have a small button that I've put over here on my left ear, behind my left ear, that you kind of can't really see, but I'll do a close-up uh, when I'm editing this video. And you press it once to close the helmet, and you press it again to open the helmet. And if you double tap the button, it will turn the eyes off. And then if you double tap the button again, it will turn the eyes on. So here's a quick demo of how that works. So press once to close. Okay, and so since I can see through the eyes right now, it is a little bit difficult. But if I double tap the button, the eyes turns off. And I don't know if you can see my eyes through this, but much easier to see with the eyes off, as you can imagine. If I double tap it again, well, that's, I have to be kind of quick with it, but I'll do it again. So you double tap the eyes, turn them off, double tap them again to turn it back on. And then a single tap again opens the helmet up. So besides just that, I have this IR remote that I have put a uh, IR signal. It's really hard. There's a little receiver right here in the ear part. I'll do a close up of that as well. But I can use the buttons of zero through nine to control various features of the helmet. So um, one of the features of the helmet is that you can't, can't see it while I have it on, but when I turn the helmet off, and I turn it back on, this isn't just closing, when I actually turn it on and off, it will play a Jarvis uh, little sound bite. At your service. But I also have additional sound bites that I can play through this. So if I press one on this little remote, it will close the helmet. If I press three on this remote, it will turn the eyes off. If I press two on the remote, it will turn the eyes on. And if I press four on the remote, Sir, Agent Coulson of S.H.I.E.L.D. is on the line. If I press five, The clean slate protocol, sir. Six. That's the emergency alert triggered by the power dropping below five percent. Seven. As always, sir, a great pleasure watching you. Eight. The house party protocol, sir. Nine. Power of 400 capacity. And then to start to see it. Zero to open it back up. Maybe I can't. There we go. <laughs> you have to kind of aim it right at it, but it does work. So the final way for me to control this helmet I mentioned is through my voice. So it's a little bit gimmicky because I have to be standing in this specific room in my home to do it, but it does work, so I thought I would mention it. So essentially the way it works is I have an IR blaster. It's a uh, um, Broadlink RM4 Pro that allows it to memorize certain IR signals from a remote, and then at the sound of my voice, broadcast them through the room, essentially mimicking what this does, but without me doing anything. So just to demo that, close Iron Man. Open Iron Man. So it's a little bit gimmicky, but hey, it does work. Okay, now let's get into how I actually made this thing. So I own an Ender 3 Pro, and if you look right here, you can see that the helmet is much bigger than the build plate of my 3D printer. 
so the only way that I could print this was to print a bunch of smaller parts first and then join them together. If you're wondering where I got the 3D model for this, I found it on cgtrader.com by a guy named Akira Yuming. And yes, it does cost money, but I've always found these models to be great. So one of the big questions everyone asks when doing this is, how do you know it's going to fit your head? Well, test fittings. The way that I did it is to cut a small ring out of the helmet, print that first, and then see if it would fit over my head. The last thing you want to do is print an entire helmet for it to not fit. You'll notice here I have the full model open in a free program called Autodesk Mesh Mixer. This program has a very easy to use plane cutting feature that I'll show here. To do this, go to Edit, Plane Cut. That will pull up a horizontal plane that you can use to cut the model. The way this works is it will cut away everything on one side of the plane. So now you'll use these controls here to move the plane around to cut away what you want. In our case, we want to cut away most of the top of the helmet and leave the very bottom. So we'll need to flip this plane around so that it leaves the bottom. For this helmet, you only need the very entryway into the helmet, so we'll be making two cuts to help rid some of the excess that we don't want to print just to see if this fits. Once you have the plane in exactly the right spot, you'll go up to this little window towards the top and press accept. And now we'll repeat this to do the second cut to get rid of some more of the excess. Now this ring may still be a bit large, so in my case I had to cut it again down the middle, but this time instead of discarding, I'm going to keep both halves. Now it may look like it didn't do anything, but if you go over to this option called Separate Shells, it'll bring up a window that will allow you to select each of the halves. Now it's just a matter of selecting one half, then going up to File, Export, and then repeating the process for the other half. This will give you two individual STL files that you'll then print, glue them back together, and then see if it fits over your head. Inside of the slicing program Cura, or whatever program you use to do your slicing, is where you'll decide the size percentage that you'll use for printing. I ended up printing mine at 105%, but I do have somewhat of a wide head. Also, back in Mesh Mixer, I want to show you one other feature that may come in very handy. Once you download the model, you'll notice that it does come already separated out into some smaller parts. Some of these files are still a bit big for my printer. For example, this already separated top part. But once you open the file inside of Mesh Mixer, you can go to Edit and then Separate Shells, and it will divide the helmet up into much smaller parts that you can print. Then it's just a matter of repeating that same process of going to file and export for each one. Once you've decided the scale percentage and have all your parts separated, it's time to start actually printing the helmet. I used less than one kilogram of a roll of filament to print this helmet, so it costs less than $20. I also chose to use an infill of about 30 to 40%, as well as setting the wall count to three to make sure that the helmet was pretty strong. I'd say this took about a week to print, but I also didn't have my printer running 24-7. Once I had all the parts printed, I used some tape to piece them together to make sure that it fit my head. If you saw my 1 3rd scale Iron Man 3D printing video, you'll know that I spent a ton of time hand sanding each individual part. So for this project, I wanted to try something a bit easier, so although I still did do some hand sanding, I let most of the initial work be done by using a mouse sander. This drastically cut down on the initial time required for sanding. After the mouse sanding at 120 grit, I followed up another pass of hand sanding at 220 grit, as well as another pass at 600 grit. You only have to put in as much effort as you want to get out of this. I wanted mine extremely smooth and with zero layer lines, so I put in the extra effort. For those of you with a sharp eye, you may see something interesting in this clip. These are PLA welding marks, and it's how I joined all the small prints into the final helmet. I'll show you what I mean by that here. 
I unfortunately forgot to record this part for this helmet, so here's a clip of me PLA welding parts for another helmet. See if you can guess what helmet this is and put it in the comments below. The first step is to tape together your parts but leave some wide open spaces that are flat like you see here. Next you'll want to get a soldering iron that you can dedicate solely for this process. The one I got cost literally $12 and I marked it with a piece of duct tape so I know which is which. Now once your soldering iron is heated up, use it to press into the PLA to essentially weld the parts together. You'll notice pressing into it raises up the edges around it, so just make sure you fold those back into the little hole. You'll need to do this in multiple places so that you can guarantee the parts are strong and won't break. Eventually it'll be solid enough that you can remove the tape you put on and then go back and weld those parts as well. Once you've done this in enough places, the parts will be very strong as one solid piece and you should have no other problems with the parts coming apart. Now obviously because you just created large holes in your print, you'll need to go back and fill in the holes with something like this wood filler. Once that's dry, you'll need to then sand down all the excess and rinse and repeat until you get a very smooth surface. Once all the parts were sanded and smooth, I then coated the entire helmet in this Rust-Oleum 2-in-1 sandable primer. I didn't record this process, but it's pretty easy to understand. Basically just rinse and repeat with the filler primer and sanding until you get a very smooth surface that you're happy with. Here's what my helmet ended up looking like after I was satisfied with this process. It's now at this point when I began to focus my attention to the electronics. You definitely want to do this at this point. That way you don't have to worry about scratching up a painted helmet. It'd be much harder to do this while also trying to worry about scratching the paint. Now let me introduce you to the brains of this helmet. I did not create this. As it turns out, there are some very nice people across the internet that have luckily done most of the hard work for all of the electronics for us. Let me introduce you to the Crashworks 3D MK6 Alicia board. Now they don't sell this on a website, but they do have an eBay storefront where they sell all types of custom boards meant for creating helmets and all sorts of props. Now this is an already pre-programmed Arduino Nano that is attached to a custom printed circuit board that allows you to essentially plug and play almost all of the electronics we'll need for this helmet. This MK6 board takes care of the LED eyes and the servo motors that are needed to open and close the helmet. For sound, they also have another board that you can easily plug into the MK6. The SU board, which stands for Sound Unit Expansion. I also want to mention they also sell another board called the MK7 that already has the SU board integrated. So if you're planning on doing sound from the get-go, it might be easier to just start with the MK7. I started with the MK6 because I wasn't sure if I'd be up to doing the sound, but it turned out to be really easy, and as soon as I figured that out, I ordered the SU board. So besides the MK6 Alicia board, here's a quick rundown of some of the other parts I used to go along with this. These MG90S servo motors that are sold in pairs. Some of these battery operated flexible LED eyes that will cut away from the battery pack. A micro limit switch or some other type of button. The Alicia board does come with a variety of wires and plugs, but you'll also need some of these extra wires for doing various things. And along with that also some heat shrink tubing. You'll also need a battery pack, though pay attention if it supports an always on feature. This particular battery pack does, but there are many that do not. You technically can use a battery pack that doesn't support this feature, but then you'll also need to get the Crashworks Penelope board and that board will allow the battery pack to always stay on. Otherwise, you'll be fighting the battery going to sleep after only a couple of minutes. And I guess this goes without saying, but just in case, you'll obviously need a soldering iron and some solder. If you plan on using the SU board or you bought an MK7 board, you'll need a speaker and an 8GB micro SD card. And also, if you want to do the remote control functionality, you'll need one of these infrared wireless remote control sensor modules. You're also going to need some M3 or M4 bolts and screws for setting up the hinges for the servo motors. The Alicia board does come with some great instructions, but here's an overview of how everything works. When connecting the battery pack to the Alicia board, 
be sure to plug the USB mini cord into the dedicated USB port on the board itself, instead of the Arduino. You don't want to power the servo motors with only power coming from the Arduino, as it's definitely not meant to do that. The servo motors are pretty straightforward. Essentially plug the jumper cables that are attached to the motors into the provided cables that come with the Alicia board. Then you can plug that into the dedicated spots for both of the motors on the Alicia board. After you solder one of the provided plugs into the LED eyes, you can then attach them to the dedicated spot on the Alicia board. The board actually has two dedicated spots for each eye, but since I soldered both eyes into one plug, I used the other plug to power an additional set of eyes that I actually use to put LEDs covering the small holes on the back of the helmet. Next I soldered another one of the provided plugs to the limit switch button to be able to control the helmet. The limit switch comes with three prongs sticking out as well as a rolling lever, but I just clipped off one of the prongs and then pulled off the rolling lever. And then once you plug the limit switch button into the Alicia board, you should now have the minimum working circuit, and you can test it out by plugging in the power and pressing the button. It's really cool that all this works without having to touch a single line of code. At this point you could move on to installing the SU board for sound, but if you don't want that, you can skip ahead and install the hinge system. The SU board is also pretty straightforward. The SU board comes with directions that will show you how to format the SD card, and once you do that, it's just a matter of adding the MP3s onto the SD card, and then inserting the card into the slot on the SU board. The SU board has two options for plugging in your speaker. You can either use the barrel jack, or you can solder your speaker to one of the provided plugs, and then plug that into the SU board where it's labeled speaker. Then finally use the two plugs coming out of the SU board and connect them to the dedicated spots on the Alicia board. Now to actually enable the sound, you do need to go change one single line of code in the Arduino, but we'll go over that in a bit. For now, here's a demonstration of what you would see once you do that. So cool. Next I'm going to explain the IR module, or infrared module. This is what will give the helmet the remote control functionality. If you don't care or don't want to have this feature, you can skip ahead. The thing in my right hand is the IR receiver. It has these three prongs you'll need to make sure that you wire up and solder to these three holes. Make sure you get the orientation correct. Basically just look for the curve of these to know which way it's supposed to line up. You'll want to cut these prongs a bit shorter, as there's no really point to having them this long. On the other side of the module, you'll find these six prongs, but you really only need three. If you want, you can cut off the other three. Here's a comparison to my already working module. You'll need to either use jumper cables or solder three different color wires to the three prongs. To connect this to the Alicia board, we need to plug in the three wires coming from the IR module to specific spots on the Alicia board. So on the IR module, you'll notice that there are three labels for VCC, ground, and in. In being the wire that will connect to any available digital pin. Essentially, we need to connect these to the same labeled pins on the Alicia board. So on the Alicia board, there is a VCC and a ground pin next to each other, but unfortunately there is no digital pin next to them. These instead are analog. Notice the A on the label. So we'll need to split off the end pin to go to one of the available digital pins. On the SU board, there happens to be an unused socket labeled button that has an available digital pin, D12. This is where we'll connect our end pin. If all of that was confusing, here's a graphic I made that can hopefully help to explain it further. Essentially, we have two pins that we need to connect to the Alicia board and one pin that we need to connect to the SU board. So what I've done here is solder the end pin to one of the provided plugs that came with the Alicia board, cutting off the excess wire that I won't be needing, and also done the same thing with the VCC and ground pins to another one of the provided plugs that came with the Alicia board, 
you may need to trim off one of the rails on the edge of the plug in order to actually fit it into the socket on the Alicia board. Now you can plug in the VCC and ground to the Alicia board, and then plug in the N to the SU board so that it aligns with D12. Now this won't work just yet, as we still need to go and add some code to program the Arduino to understand and read the IR module. But when you turn on the power to the Alicia board, you should at least see the LED on the IR module turn on. Okay, so Arduino code. I realize for a lot of people, you may have some WTF moments. But, I promise, if you give this a shot, it's not nearly as difficult as you think, even if you've never touched programming before. If you're looking to just have the LED eyes turn on and have the faceplate open and close, you actually don't need to do any of this. The Alicia board already has all the code programmed and working on the board that they send to you. You only need to do this if you want to add sound or you want to incorporate the IR module, or you just want to tinker with the code that's already on the board. So to get started, you need to go and download the Arduino IDE. It's basically the place that you write all the code. After you have that installed, now we need to go and download the code so we can make some changes to it. I'm going to go over two different things in the code, enabling the sound and then setting up the IR module. So I'll have a section dedicated to each of these things, but for both of these, you'll at least need to follow the initial process to get things up and running. To download the code, you'll need to go to one of these specific URLs, click on the green code button, and then download the zip file. Once you unzip that, you'll find a file labeled ironmanservo.ino. This is our code. But before we jump into that, inside the mp3 folder, you'll find some sound files that you'll need to copy to your micro SD card. If you're not doing the IR module, you'll need the first three. But if you are, you'll need all nine. If you double click on the ironmanservo.ino, it will launch the Arduino IDE and show you the code. Now that we have the code, you'll also need to go and download some additional files, the libraries that Arduino uses in order to do certain things. Back on the initial GitHub page, you'll find some URLs to some additional libraries that will take you to other GitHub pages where you'll need to go and download the releases that they list on the right hand side of the page. You'll need to do this for each of the libraries listed. To install each library, go back into the Arduino IDE and go up to Sketch, Include Library, and then Add Zip Library. Do this for each one. I've already done this, so I'm not going to do it again here. Once you've got everything set up, you can verify it's all working by going up to Sketch and then Verify and Compile. You'll then see it says Compiling Sketch towards the bottom. And then once everything's done, it'll say done compiling. That means that everything's set up correctly. Now we have one more step before we can actually begin changing the code. We need to make sure that you can upload the code to the Arduino. Plug in your USB mini into the Arduino Nano itself, not the Alicia board. In my example here, I've actually removed the Arduino from the Alicia board completely, but you can actually leave it on the board just be sure to disconnect the servo motors before you plug it in. Once it's plugged in, go up to Tools and then Board and make sure Arduino Nano is selected. Then go to Processor and make sure AT Mega 328P is selected. Then you need to make sure that the right port is chosen. If you're not sure which port is the right one, unplug your Arduino and then plug it back in and you should see a port you didn't see before show up. In my case, it's COM3, but the number really depends on the USB you connect it to. Yours probably will say a different number. Finally, we can try to upload. So go up to Sketch, and then Upload. Or you can press the right arrow button. You should see that it says Uploading, and then... Uh-oh, we got an error. So if you see this, don't worry. It's probably just your USB port. In fact, I actually ran into this a couple of times on a port that I had working and then sometimes it would just spit this out randomly. So the solution for me is to just unplug the USB and plug it back in and then try again. I had this happen to me at least five or six times throughout my process. You can also just try plugging it into a different USB port if it still won't connect. 
I also found plugging it into a USB hub caused it to work less than if I directly plugged it into my computer. So don't get frustrated, keep trying, and then eventually you should get it to work. You'll see a done uploading message if it all worked correctly. Now let's get into the code. If you're using the original Crashworks 3D Arduino code and you want to enable the sound, keep listening. If you're using my modified code that includes the sound and has support for the IR module, you can skip ahead to the next chapter or just follow along if you want to have a better understanding of some basics. So to enable the sound is very simple. Like I said, only one line of code needs to change, and that's here. You need to get rid of these two slash marks in front of the hashtag define sound, and that's it. If you're curious, the two slashes is a way to write comments in code. It's pretty much the same for all programming languages. You can even add your own comments if you like. Now, getting rid of the slashes would make the compiler think this was supposed to be real code, and it would complain if you went and pressed the verify and compile because what we wrote isn't really valid code. But as long as you have the slashes, you can put anything you want. That's why getting rid of the slashes in front of the defined sound make it start working. And now that you've made that change, you can go up and press the verify and compile. And after that, you can press the upload button. Now I wanna go over a few more things that you can easily change to customize this just a bit further. If you scroll down a little bit in the code and you go to line 109, there are four options that you can change that will affect the angles of the servos. There are two for the open position and two for the closed position. The two servos work in opposite directions of each other, so they need to stay in sync but remain opposites. If you change one, you'll need to change the other to mirror its opposite angle. The values go from 0 to 180, so for example, for the Mark 85 helmet, I found changing the open positions to 0 for servo 1 and 180 for servo 2 helped to keep the mask from dripping down. I also changed the closed position for servo 1 to be 170 and the servo 2 to be 10, as I found it helped to make sure the mask closed all the way. Again, these are options that I only suggest you change if you feel you need to. You'll need to experiment to see what best works for you. Feel free to continue reading through the code as there are some other options that you can change to customize things just a bit further. For example, here you can change what happens for the first time boot up eye animation. If you're looking to set up the IR module, keep listening. Otherwise, you can skip ahead to installing the servo hinge system. Now, I'm assuming at this point you've downloaded my modified code and are not using the original Crashworks 3D code. In my modified code, I have already enabled the sound and changed a few things, like the servo angles, but feel free to change those to whatever suits you. So by default, everything is already in place to get the IR module working. But, depending on what remote you have, or where you got it, you're going to need to change some values. Right now, everything is set up to work with my exact IR remote. If you have a different one, or you're experiencing things are not working, you're definitely going to need to make some changes. When you press a button on the IR remote, a certain signal is sent and then read by the IR receiver, interpreting it into a specific command. Usually it's just a number, like 8, 22, or 30, or all sorts of numbers. So you're going to need to figure out what command your remote is sending when you press a button and then change the code to reflect that. To do this, plug in your Arduino into your computer while it is still attached to the Alicia board with the servos disconnected with the IR module connected. Inside the code, scroll down towards the bottom and you'll find a section called Setup. It should be somewhere between line 750 to 850. You'll notice a line of code that reads serial.begin115200. Remember this number. Now go up to Tools, and then Serial Monitor. This will open another window that should hopefully start spewing out some text about what is currently happening on the Arduino. If you don't see the text, then at the bottom of this window, make sure the drop-down shows the exact number that I just told you to remember a moment ago. If not, change it to that number, and then hopefully you should start seeing some text that is readable. Now if you press some buttons on your remote, you should hopefully start seeing some codes showing up in this window. Now you need to make a list of every code that you see when you press buttons 0 through 9. 
You can technically use any button you want to control anything, but these just made it a bit more simple for me. After you have figured out the command code for each button, you can now go back to the Arduino IDE and go to around line 660, and you'll find a section called Monitor IR. Inside this big block of code, you'll find a list of commands that I have already set up when doing my helmet. You'll need to change the numbers for each section to match whatever buttons you want to run these actions. After you've done this, you can finally press the upload button and when done, try using your remote. Hopefully you'll be able to now remote control the action of opening and closing the faceplate, turning on and off the eyes, and then playing six additional sounds. Okay, so now to install the servo motors and hinge kit in your helmet. On the website Thingiverse, there are some files created by Crashworks 3D that are meant to go with everything we've done so far. You'll need to go and download all these files and 3D print them. You do not need to change the scale of these files as they are meant to go with any scale helmet you've made. And for actually doing the installation, if you scroll down a bit on this page, you'll find an absolutely amazing YouTube video created by the amazing YouTuber Frankly Built that completely covers everything you need to know about this kit and how to install it. I couldn't begin to try to explain it any better than his video already does. So that's why I'm 100% recommending you watch his video for this part. This video is already pretty long and to try to thoroughly explain this step would make it drastically longer. It'd be easy to call this step one of the hardest parts of this entire helmet. So rather than try to do it better, I'm just directing you to go watch the master himself. After you've installed the motors and hinge kit, you should end up with something like this. Now for the final step of the helmet, painting. I unfortunately didn't record every single step in this painting process, but since the steps are exactly the same as when I painted my one-third scale Iron Man, I'll be using some clips from that to help explain. We'll be applying multiple layers of paint, but the first layer of paint is a coat of the Rust-Oleum Flat Black. This step was important because it can help to highlight any imperfections you might have missed or created during the motor installation. And I must admit, seeing the helmet in a solid flat black is really cool looking. It kind of makes me want to do this all again and just leave it black. Once I was satisfied with the black and the paint was completely dry, I then covered the entire helmet with a couple of layers of the Rust-Oleum Metallic Gold. After the gold was completely dry, it was time to start masking off certain sections of the helmet. I used this really nice frog tape to do so. Masking off certain sections can be a bit cumbersome, especially on curves, but I found that by using a pointed tool like a small knife or a razor to press into the seam lines of the helmet, you could slowly but surely get really nice and clean edges. I know you don't see it here, but I recommend you first mask off the reverse of what I'm doing in this clip, that way you can paint the darker parts you see here with the Krylon Metallic Dark Metal. Once the Dark Metal Metallic paint has completely dried, you've removed the tape from the gold and then masked off the dark metal itself, it's time for the most difficult paint layer, the red. So this red paint isn't a typical spray paint. It's a semi-transparent casting paint that is meant to be applied over top of a metallic paint. That's why we covered the entire helmet in gold first. Now a word of warning, this paint absolutely loves to create runs. It is very easy to spray too much paint and create dark spots, so please take your time. It's also better to be further away than too close. You can always add another layer if it's too light, but it's extremely difficult to fix if you make it too dark. Basically, you'll have to sand off everything and probably start again. I ended up doing three light layers of the red, waiting about 10 minutes between each layer. Also, once we add the clear coat, the red will get much brighter, so keep that in mind. You'll need to let the paint completely dry. I'd recommend at minimum 24 hours, but I waited 48 in total just to be safe. After the red is completely dry and you've removed the frog tape, you can move on to the final layer, the clear coat. I use this amazing Duplicolor 1K Clear Extreme Gloss Finish. This stuff is magic. Start by doing one very light pass of it, almost like a fine dust. 
Then letting each layer dry for about 10 minutes, follow up with two to three more coats. It might look a little foggy, but after about 24 hours, any fog should clear up and reveal a very nice finish. I will admit I was a bit scared that I did the red too dark, but once the clear coat dried, it revealed a very nice and shiny finish that I can say I'm very proud of. After the clear coat is dry, you can move on to the very last step of this helmet, hot gluing all the internals into their final resting place and then adding some padding. Here are a couple of shots of what my helmet looked like when I finished this step. I placed the battery at the top and put the Arduino and other boards towards the back of the helmet. That way my head presses against the battery and not the web of wires. Now it's up to you if you want to do this, but I then bought some metal snap buttons and glued them to the inside. Then I attached some buttons to a cut piece of black felt fabric to help cover the wires. It makes it look a bit nicer on the inside and helps protect the wires a bit more. After all that, it is finally done. This project took me a little over two months to make, though I wasn't constantly working on it. It's really just mainly been a project for the weekends but I still had a ton of fun whenever I had time to dedicate to it. Some of the things that I really enjoyed was discovering just exactly how to control servos and setting up my first remote controlled project. Granted, most of the initial programming was already done. I still learned a lot and I felt like it was a great project that sort of acted like a stepping stone to further things. If I had to do it all over again, there are definitely some things that I would do different, but all in all, I'm very proud of this thing. Who knows where this will take me? If you made it all the way through this video, I want to say I really appreciate you watching. This was definitely my longest video I've ever made. Okay guys, so that about wraps up this video. I make all types of videos related to 3D printing, The Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and kind of just technology in general. So if you feel I'm worthy and you like this, I'd appreciate it if you could hit the subscribe button or the like button to let Google know that this was a cool video and to share it around. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Until next time, bye bye.